Hi guys. Um, I thought I'd take some time to try to explain some stuff about World War II. Obviously not as much as we normally would, but I don't know. I thought you might like to hear me explain it rather than me giving you more videos to watch. So I'm giving you my own video to watch. Um, so World War II, at least for the part of Germany, there are, there are a couple root causes I think we have to understand. One is the stab in the back theory. Um, a bunch of German soldiers who were quite dissatisfied with the way World War I ended. They believed that, well, they had been told that they were winning the war um, up until they were told they lost the war. Um, and they felt that their government had betrayed them um, by signing the, the Versailles Treaty. They also really, really didn't like the Versailles Treaty. Um, the Versailles Treaty was very, very unfair to the German, to Germany as a nation, um, and it caused significant uh, political and economic damage to the country. Uh, inflation by the early 20s was so bad that it was one American dollar equaled approximately four trillion with a T um, German marks. So basically, the paper that the German marks were printed on was more valuable than the quote-unquote currency. Then in the 1930s, um, the Great Depression hits. Um, the Great Depression was not a U.S. thing, it was a global thing. Um, so the same problems we're having in the U.S. are ha happening in Germany. So on top of their already kind of weak and not very stable government, they're really pissed off soldiers. They're already not doing great economy. Now they have a depression to, de tend, uh, to deal with. In 1931, Japan decides that it needs to expand in order to gain resources. The way they're looking at it is Europe and now the United States have been expanding into Southeast Asia and gobbling up uh, lots of places to get the resources. And Japan believes that if it doesn't start expanding soon, um, they're going to lose out on a lot of things. So that's exactly what they do. They start expanding, and the first place they expand to is Manchuria, which is north of Korea. Um, it's kind of the northeast section of China. It's what we would now call China. Um, so they invade that area and take it over to see what people will do. And basically people are like, yep, that's nice. We don't got time to deal with you. In 1936, obviously in March, that's what the screen says, the Germans send troops into the Rhineland, which is kind of this salmon pinky orangey color right here. Um, the Rhineland had been demilitarized. What that means is the Germans were not allowed to have any soldiers there. And Hitler had been quietly and secretly rebuilding their army, which was a violation of the Versailles Treaty. He was purposely doing these things to see what the Allies would do. They didn't stop him from building the army, and then when he sent it into the Rhineland, they were like, okay, we have this like Great Depression thing to deal with, so whatever, dude, just don't be dumb. The US's response to all of these acts of aggression by both Japan and Germany, and Italy actually, was to pass four different neutrality acts, which basically said, we're not getting involved, have a nice life, hope it works out for you. Some people were so concerned in the United States that we would get involved, and what they were afraid of was another World War I. They were afraid we were going to go fight a foreign war somewhere, and a lot of people were going to die again for absolutely zero gain and zero legitimate reasons. Charles Lindbergh, this dude right here, hopefully you remember, he was the first to... Uh, fly solo across the Atlantic, um, was a big proponent of the America First Committees. In 1936, uh, Benito Mussolini, this dude, um, who is, whoops, who is uh, the fascist dictator of Italy, signs an agreement with this dude, who is, of course, Hitler, the fascist dictator of um, Nazi Germany. So we're starting to see the coalescing of all the fascists into one giant alliance. 
Another fascist nation was Spain. Francisco Franco, who is the dude depicted in this picture, um, was trying to turn Spain into a fascist nation. And they fought a civil war for three years, um, very bloody war. The Italians, which are seen here, are uh, fascist troops, are sent from Italy to support um, Franco's troops in the war. The German Luftwaffe uses various uh, cities that are strongholds against Franco's forces for bombing practice so they can try out their new uh, lightning war tactics. Um, and people across the world, including the United States, were extremely concerned about the spread of fascism. And so much so, there was a large, about 40,000 volunteers that went to Spain many from the United States into what, and they formed international brigades. The one from the United States was called the Lincoln Brigade. Japan, in its invasion of Ch China, was very brutal. These images are depicting the various massacres. Yes, those are children on the top right-hand side, and those are the heads of people who have been executed on the bottom right. Um, so, Fascism, Japan was also fascist, so this is what people are associating with fascism, and frankly, rightly so. In 1938, Hitler decides to test um, the Allies again. And what he does is he convinces Austria to vote to join with Germany. The vote is, I think, 98% um, of the Austrian government votes in favor of joining with Germany. Um, so they do. Then we have the Sudetenland, which is this lovely pukey brown color right here. The Sudetenland was territory that was traditionally German, and it was taken from Germany after World War I and given to Bohemia, um, which was combined with Moravia and Slovakia to become Czechoslovakia. Um, and Hitler was basically saying, look, um, all the German, traditional German people deserve to be connected to and living with all the rest of the German people. So I want to take the Sudetenland and add it to Germany so that way we are all one big happy German family. Not sure you could actually hear that, but that was Neville Chamberlain, the dude on the picture here, and that was those the words he was saying were the words he said when this picture was taken, which is he had just returned from Munich talking with Hitler, and they basically said, look, you can have the Sudetenland, but that's it. You're done. And Hitler signed it and said, yeah, sure, I'm done. No problem. I won't take anything else. I promise. So Czechoslovakia... In 1939, one year later, after that was signed, he took the Sudetenland, and then in 1939, he's like, yeah, well, you know what? Czechoslovakia actually wants to be German, so I'm just going to make them German. Have a nice day. In August 1939, um, the Germans sign a non-aggression pact with Stalin. And there he is. That's Stalin. Um, this agreement basically says, look, if and when we invade Poland, you can have the other half. How's that, how's that sound? If you agree to stay out of our way and not, like, enter the war against us. So the Soviet Union's like, yeah, what the hell? We'll do that. Um, and then, less than a month later, uh, Poland's attacked on September 1st, 1939. Um... Blitzkrieg is the German word for lightning war. What that means is you hit them with everything you got. Your Luftwaffe, your air force goes in and bombs the crap out of things while your panzer, your tank divisions, race across the countryside, closely followed by your um, those other dudes, your troops, your infantry. 
um, and you just overwhelm them. I believe Poland collapsed in uh, less than six weeks. Um, later on, by 1940, um, by the spring of 1940, Hitler is moving west. He realizes that if he wants to do his ultimate goal, which is to attack the Soviet Union, he's going to have to take care of the Western Allies first. So he invades the Lowlands, which is modern day um, Denmark, <coughs> excuse me, um, the Netherlands, etc., Belgium, and then he goes into um, France. France and Britain have already declared war once he invaded Poland, um, and the Allied troops, French and British troops, end up getting cornered at Dunkirk, um, and they are, for some reason, the Germans just stop and kind of hold them there, occasionally shoot at them, and The Miracle at Dunkirk, great movie, I suggest you watch it. Um, several hundred thousand soldiers are rescued by naval ships and civilians with like fishing boats and stuff. It's pretty cool. Uh, in June 1940, shortly after Dunkirk, um, France surrenders. Um, here are German troops moving into uh, Paris. There's Hitler, you know, looking at all the sights. And this dude is just a famous picture of a French dude crying because, you know, his country just got taken over. Um, now, for U.S. history, the U.S. in 1941 is like Roosevelt wants to support the British. He wants to support the Allies. He realized the expansion of fascism is obviously not a good thing. Um, so he gets Congress to pass what's called the Lend-Lease Act. And what it is, is the U.S., while we will remain neutral in the war, we will lend old military equipment to countries and we will lease it to them. Um, payment to be made at a future date. So this slide is showing us how much uh, lending and leasing we did to various allies. I totally forgot to shut off all these sound effects. And its commonwealth last for a thousand years. Men will still say, this was their final tower. So that kind of went by kind of quick. Sorry for the weird sound effects you probably can't really hear. Damn it. Ah. So the Battle of Britain... Um, was mainly a bombing campaign originally Hitler had planned to invade Britain but um, his attack on Norway was worse than he thought it would be and his navy was not up to invading Britain Britain was bombed every night for a several months straight um, as you can see in this bottom left corner these these two older people walking through the rubble um, the smoke from the fires literally every night people were doing this they were in bomb shelters the famous um tunnels um the tube as it's called the uh what's it called uh subway the subways became bomb shelters um so every night people basically just went down in the bomb shelters and hung out while their bomb while their city got pounded in the ground the royal air force put up a major fight um and were actually quite successful um, partially because the British had adopted the use of radar very early on. Um, so they typically knew when the Germans were coming, so the Royal Air Force was able to get up in the air and fight back. They used a plane, as you can see in the top right, called Spitfires. They were lightweight and very fast and very maneuverable. Much more maneuverable than the German Luftwaffe. In August 1941, um, Roosevelt, President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill met on a battleship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, um, and they signed what's called the Atlantic Charter, which was basically a statement that once the war was over, um, they, first of all, the, Britain, the British and the United States are allies. Um, this was basically Wilson's 14 points. Um, which, you know, he was trying to make sure that the world was safe and that something like World War II would never happen again. And if we had actually listened to him, World War II probably wouldn't have happened. Um, 
and it also called for a League of Nations. So basically, this is Roosevelt and Churchill saying, okay, Wilson was right, and we should have listened to him in 1919. As usual, the largest mistake military people make is invading Russia, because Russia is ginormous, and there's no possible way to actually control the country. So, but Hitler invades in 1941, in December 1941. Second mistake, he invades in the winter. You don't go to Russia in the winter. Um, but anyway, um, he invades. This was his goal for the entire time. He feels like by December 41 that he has uh, gotten the Western allies under control enough. He is also aware that... Um, the Japanese are probably going to be joining the war pretty soon. Notice December 1941. Um, a certain thing happens then. Um, and that he needs to attack the Soviet Union to distract them, to keep them away from attacking Japan. Basically, let's force them to be on a two-front war. Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin are called the Big Three. This is them meeting at Yalta, which is a like a resort town in the Crimea. Um, if you don't know where that is, look it up. Um, this is the first of many three-way meetings they had for like war planning and peace planning and all that kind of stuff. Once the U.S. entered this, the war after um, the attack on Pearl Harbor, which you've already done some exercises around that, um, the first place the U.S. goes besides attacking in the Pacific, which we'll get to later, um, the first place the U.S. goes is it is actually Africa, North Africa, and the, the U.S. and British um, beat back Rommel and his tanks, and then from there they decide to attack Italy um, and work their way up through there. Uh, shortly thereafter, Eisenhower gives orders for D-Day, Operation Overlord, a.k.a. the invasion of France, which has been um, being planned for several years at this point. They knew they needed to open a front in France, but it was not an easy thing to plan or do. Here's basic map, D-Day. Um, you can see five beaches. Um, it wasn't just the Americans, of course. The British and Canadians also were part of D-Day. And now a whole bunch of other war stuff happens. You know, people die, they fight, those types of things. Like I said, this is a very quick overview. And then in February 1945, um, Yalta happens. And FDR, so by February 1945, it's pretty clear the Allies are going to defeat Germany and probably pretty soon, by the spring. And lo and behold, in the spring of 1945, Germany surrenders. Churchill wants the Soviets to immediately enter the war in the Pacific to help them against the Japanese. Um, which Stalin agrees to do, but in exchange for this, they, Stalin is insisting that he wants what's called a buffer zone between Germany and the Soviet Union for fear that the Germans might attack them again. This is just a way for him to get his hands on a bunch of countries. Um... And FDR argues for the United Nations, you know, which he got. Mussolini's mistress, mistress um, are caught, quote-unquote, tried and executed at Claretta Patacci. Um, or sorry, his mistress is Claretta Patacci. Um, they are executed, hung upside down, and lots of other tortury things done to them in Milan in 1945. Um, so that's obviously not good. As the Allies move in from the Americans or British are moving in through Belgium this way, the Soviets are coming in through Poland, both are getting to Berlin. The Germans really wanted the Americans to get to Berlin first because they didn't want to have to deal with the Soviets. Unfortunately for them, the Soviets got there first. But as they're doing this, they are discovering all these red dots, which are the concentration camps. Now, let's be clear here. We knew they existed. We knew they were not good. But there was nothing we could do about it. Um, so what this is, is 
is we're finally actually getting to see how bad the concentration camps were. Um, and of course, we discover the crematoriums. Uh, we discover places like Auschwitz. Buchenwald. Buchenwald, by the way, is literally right next to Auschwitz. One was a death camp, one was a work camp. Buchenwald was the work camp. Um, and here is Elie Wiesel, author of Night, you know, famous author. And this is the kind of thing they found. Mass graves. April 1930, Hitler commits suicide in his bunker. This is showing you where the bunker was. It's underground, you know, it's a parking lot now. This was his wife. They'd only been married like a few days. So on May 8th, my grandmother's birthday, by the way, 1945, she would have been 15 that year, um, Germany surrendered. Um, and there's General Keitel in the bottom, in the middle, signing the ceasefire. And then there were rejoicing crowds everywhere. Here is King George, Queen Elizabeth, Winston Churchill. This is Princess Elizabeth, now Queen Elizabeth, and that's her sister Margaret. Um, I would say, are there any questions? But, you know, you're not sitting in my living room with me, so I'm going to not ask for questions. Instead, I'll dive into the Pacific Theater. This is Admiral Yamamoto. Admiral Yamamoto is the mastermind behind, sorry, this PowerPoint has some auto things in it and I forgot to take them out. Admiral Yamamoto was the mastermind behind Pearl Harbor. He was not really in favor of doing it, but kind of gave in. And so he planned the best operation he could. You have to admit it was a pretty good operation. Um, this image was taken by a Japanese pilot as they flew over Pearl Harbor. As you can see, our ships are literally lined up just sitting there, literally sitting ducks. Um, famous picture, date which was of an infamy. Um, I believe that's the USS Arizona exploding. Um, as you should know by now from your... Uh, work on this stuff um these images were withheld from the american public for over a year here's president roosevelt signing the u.s declaration of war you listen to a speech about that and this is the pacific theater so let's let's get our bearings here's japan this is manchuria mongolia soviet union china here's hawaii really 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 far away it's about 3,000 miles from here to the u.s and it's about an equal distance to over all this stuff over here the red line indicates the greatest extent to what japan conquered quote unquote conquered notice aleutian islands u.s territory was seized by the japanese i mean the philippines were that was u.s territory but i mean like actual u.s soil how do we pay for the war? Well, we asked people to buy war bonds and we had all kinds of propaganda. You know, here's Uncle Sam with the American flag, I guess. This is showing all the allies are in there together and then war bonds with, you know, Roosevelt's picture on it. Yay. Something, another thing about, like they even did little children's stamp books. So you could at school for like 10 cents buy a stamp. And when you had enough stamps, you got a war bond issued to you. So even kids were asked to participate. After we surrendered in the Philippines, um, the American and British soldiers that were there who were captured by the Japanese were marched 60 miles in the blazing heat. Um, whether you've been to the Philippines or not, think tropical, humid, nasty. Um, so they were marched 60 miles, no food, no water, um, and many died on the way. If you fell behind, they'd just shoot you, cut you down with their sword, whatever. Um, picture on the left is showing you some British soldiers 
around when they were captured and the guy on the right is what they look like when they were liberated at the end of the war um this became a huge huge uh, what's the word I want? Issue for the American and British people. They were not happy at the treatment of their POWs by the Japanese. So very quickly after the attack of Pearl Harbor, um, the Japanese then like conquered all this stuff like within months. And then in May 1942, we have our first major battle down here of Coral Sea which is a stalemate. Um, there's no winner. Um, we sink some of their ships. They really damage some of our ships. And yeah, um, we claim victory, of course, and so do they. The turning point of the war is this one, Midway, June 3rd, 1942. It's a little outpost. It's literally a sand dune in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, and the Japanese sent a fleet up here, and they were talking a lot on the radio, so we knew they were there. So we sent a fleet up towards them, and then our code breakers figured out that they were actually heading to Midway because if they got control of Midway, they could launch planes to Hawaii very easily. So we turned our ships and headed this way and ended up having a major battle. We sunk four of their aircraft carriers which crippled their Navy. So from this point forward, the Japanese are completely on the defense. And what we start doing is down here with Guadalcanal is we start conquering, conquering, uh, liberating um, like one set of islands at a time. And you can just kind of follow it. Like we just bounce our way up until we get all the way to Iwo Jima um, in Okinawa, which are the last ones we capture. I'm not sure why this map is here twice. Um, Lieutenant Doolittle, who's this dude, um, led a raid on Tokyo in 1942. Um, there's a movie called that. It's depicted in the, the god awful Pearl Harbor movie. Um, but, uh, Anyway, this was a huge, huge big deal because Japan thought they were so far away they were safe. Um, what Doolittle and his buddies figured out was how to get, take off of aircraft carriers with bombers, which aircraft carriers were not big enough to do that. So they figured out a fancy way for them to take off um, so they could go and bomb the crap out of Tokyo to send the message to the Japanese, you're not safe. And they were able to do that. The thing was... A, they could not land on an aircraft carrier, and B, they didn't have enough fuel to come back anyway. So they um, basically crash landed in China and had to hope the Chinese could help them, which they did. Um, let's see. Battle of Coral Sea. See, lots of people everywhere, arrows, ships, Japanese stuff getting bombed and destroyed. Yay. Um, Battle of Midway, I already showed you. Um, our fleet was heading up towards these dudes and realized oh there's a big ass fleet over there so we should go there so we did and we bombed them um dr seuss uh cartoon well well seems to be a slight shifting of the japanese current like i said the battle of midway was the turning point of the war so as of june 1942 six months after the attack on pearl harbor the japanese are no longer the offensive they are now on the defensive uh, February 45, Mount Suribachi in, on Iwo Jima, the famous raising of the flag. This picture is staged. They did do this, um, but they did it with a little small battle flag. And the photographer's like, can we do it with a big flag? It'll look better. And they're like, sure. So they staged this picture to show what they had previously done. Um, now, um, so as of February, April, really April 1945, um, we are, the only thing left for us to do is to figure out how we're going to invade Japan. And the estimates for the invasion of Japan, of Japan were that the Allies would suffer um, upwards of a million casualties. That's a lot of people. And that was based on 
the kind of fighting um, we had experienced in our island hopping. Um, in some cases, places like Iwo Jima were defended by like 20,000 Japanese soldiers and they literally all fought to the death. Um, so it was like, yeah, if we invade Japan, we're screwed. Um, so while those battle plans were being drawn up, uh, Franklin Roosevelt died. He died in early April, um, 1945. He had just been inaugurated president in January of that year. It was the first time presidents were inaugurated in January. So he had been president for his fourth term for a few months and then he dies. So this dude in the middle, Truman becomes president and they meet at a place called Potsdam. Potsdam is in Germany and what they're in Churchill's been kicked to the side at this point. Uh, Clement Attlee is now the prime minister. He's the dude on the left. Um, while here, the U S successfully tests its first atomic weapon. Um, and Stalin had no idea we were even developing this weapon. The British did, but Stalin didn't. Um, and gets really, really nervous. He's already nervous because he doesn't know Truman and Attlee. And Truman has very publicly said the only good communist is a dead communist. So he already doesn't trust him. Um, some other things that come out of this conference is the Allies agree that Germany will be divided into three occupation zones. That's important for later. And that Poland, um, the borders of Poland would be kind of redrawn to make the Soviets happy. The Manhattan Project, which was based in Los Alamos, Nevada, <coughs> was the code name for our atomic weapons project. General, General, Major General Leslie Groves was officially in charge, but Robert Oppenheimer was the dude that did the science or was in charge of the science. Uh, after viewing the test of the first bomb, which that is not an image of, um, he said, I became, I am become death, the shatterer of worlds. He basically was horrified at what he had done. Um, so the decision was made that since the estimates were so high for the invasion of Japan, and we have this new fancy weapon that maybe we should try the weapon. So um, the Enola Gay, crewed by the dudes on the bottom left, um, Fly Fat Man, that ginormous bomb right there, um, from Tinian Island in 1945 over the city of Hiroshima, um, and they drop it. Um, and that's the actual picture of the explosion. And on the bottom right, you can see what's left of the city. Um, 70,000 people are killed immediately. 48,000 buildings are destroyed. And when we say destroy, we're talking like turned to dust and vaporized. Um, hundreds of thousands die of radiation poisoning and cancer later on, sometimes years later. And this is the beginning of the atomic age um, of the, you know, a 60, 70 year period where we threaten to blow each other to smithereens at any given moment. So that was August 6th. We sent a message like, surrender now. We're going to blow the crap out of here. They're like, go away. We blow the crap out of them. And then we say, uh, surrender we're going to do it again and they're like yeah no so we do it again august 9th 1945 nagasaki which is the secondary site i forgot what the other one was um smaller city so smaller casualties um but still pretty significant this is what uh burns radiation burns look like and today hiroshima has these memorials so that building um, that's what the building looked like after the bomb. So they just left it the way it was, uh, this building. Um, after the second bombing, the Japanese surrender, the emperor of Japan, um, orders the surrender and the official surrender day is September 2nd, 1945, although they unofficially surrendered before that. Um, and we have VJ Day, Victory in Japan. Here are Japanese POWs in Guam, bowing their heads. And then, of course, this famous Times Square. 
Um, this nurse died a few years ago. I think the I think the other dude might still be alive. So what are the results of the war? This is a short section, um, and I'm already going on longer than I wanted. Um, as you can see, the casualties are pretty significant. Each little symbol represents 100,000 dead. Um, as you can see, the Soviet Union, there's a lot of little symbols there. In Asia, similar thing. Um, the skulls basically represent civilians. The flags are military. With the end of the war, uh, we have the bipolarization of Europe in the beginning of the Cold War, the fight between capitalist, democratic West and communist dictatorship East. Germany is split into all these zones, the French zone, US zone, British zone, Russian zone, etc. And of course the UN's created. Uh, there's the Nuremberg war trials. Uh, many Germans are put on trial, German leaders are put on trial for crimes against humanity. The Japanese are also put on trial um, for war crimes particularly for using biochemical experiments. And it's important to remember that seven future American presidents served in this war. You have John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, um, uh, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, and this is George H.W. Bush. Because of this war, we end up getting into the space race um, because of this war, we get early computer technology. Uh, you got the Colossus on the right from 1941 and the Mark I from 1944. Um, and then ultimately the war leads to the decolonization of the European Empire. So all these things that are colored in um, were a part of various European empires. And over the course of the... 19 late 40s 50s and 60s kind of going into the 70s all of these places become their own countries separate from their european dominators and also we should mention the u.s too um so the world we live in today was formed by the events of the war world war ii and its immediate aftermath and that's all she wrote